I am so happy to welcome you all to the 2022-2023 uh, Colloquium of the College of Art, Humanities, and Social Sciences here at UMBC. My name is Rebecca Uchel. I'm the director of CADBC, the Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture. I want to open by acknowledging that this event today transpires on the lands of the Piscataway and Susquehannock and other indigenous peoples and also within the context of the exhibition behind us, Aletha Devane, Spectrum of Light and Spirit, organized by curator Lowry Stokes Sims, who calls Devane a wayfinder and a storyteller who brings the unexpected to light while finding new nuances in the old and the familiar. I hope that you will all join us in visiting the exhibition following today's interdisciplinary colloquium, which is co-hosted by CADBC along with CIRCA, the Center for Innovation, Research, and Creativity in the Arts, the Center for Social Science Scholarship, the Drescher Center for the Humanities, and the Imaging Research Center. The theme of today's discussion is resilience. I would like to acknowledge the complexity of this term by referring to the writing of Christopher Kojar, a former UMBC student, alumnus, an artist, and the son of Aletha Devane, <laughs> who writes in the exhibition catalog uh, for this show uh, when describing a 2018 trip that he and his mother took to Haiti. These are his words. Resilience. It is an ill-begotten term used today to imply the fallout placed upon people of African descent by way of Western imperialism, a word that strikes a near non-existence to any hope and prosperity that black and brown people might be able to attain in order to prevail, a term used to justify misfortune affected upon African societies in a way to be in good conscience to be when finding resolve to a hardship that is manufactured by centuries of oppression. Today's panel digs into this term. As hubs for interdisciplinary research, scholarship, and the arts, the centers hope that this panel will spark discussion and thinking about resilience across the disciplines. We, as centers, invite you to think about how resilience, the notion of sustaining what is more important in the midst of adversity, part of what you teach and research. Is resilience a core knowledge, a set of skills, or an ability that should be lifted up? If any of this seems compelling to you, we invite you to speak with your chair or director to explore how you might become involved in exploring this critical issue with your students or in your research. The sponsor of today's event is the Office of the Dean of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, so I would like to invite our dean, Dr. Kimberly Moffitt, to give her opening remarks on behalf of the college. Good afternoon. And I'm gonna keep my comments short because I will tell you, when I learned that the center directors came up with the idea of resiliency as the topic they wanted to explore for the year, I knew then that I was going to be student and not expert. And I say that because I too, similar to Chris, find this concept quite troubling. So I will share with you when I um, started thinking about remarks, I um, looked at the APA website to see how they define resiliency. And here's the definition. The process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging experiences, especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility, and adjustment to external and internal demands. That is quite optimistic and quite idealistic in many respects because I struggle that we ever actually reach such a point. But I do understand why, even um, colloquially speaking, embrace this term and have a tremendous hope for it. We think about the atrocities that happen to our children in this country, or any country, and we think if they come out of that and they seem to be a decent human being on the other side, that that's resiliency. And from my perspective, especially as someone who um, uh, opened up a charter school for predominantly black boys in, in Baltimore City, and watching 
the trauma that many of those middle school boys experience. And now seeing them, because my son was one of those students and is now college age, looking to see how they have been able to overcome or not raises questions for me of whether or not resiliency actually does exist. And if it does, what pieces are missing that we aren't dealing with so that individuals who are young children that have been harmed but mostly by adults enter into adulthood actually able to be a full-fledged human being and productive as a citizen of our society. I struggle with that because I know what I see. I know what I feel when I think about resiliency. I know what I, as an adult woman, who experienced tremendous loss in the loss of both parents and whether or not I am resilient because after almost a decade, I'm still talking about the shit. <laughs> so am I, in fact, as resilient as I think I am? And are we as a society providing all of the bits and pieces that are outlined in APA's um, definition about mental, emotional, behavioral flexibility and adjustment to actually make sure other human beings are, in fact, resilient. So I am here a student. I know I'm sounding definitive, like I know what I'm talking about, and that I understand this concept fully, but I'm really interested in learning and hearing and understanding what more can I embrace about this concept, or does this continue to help me problematize it and realize that it's not quite where we want to be? So I'm really looking forward to what today's conversation is going to be about. I also want to take the moment just to acknowledge all that are here who also feel a great interest and commitment to a conversation about resiliency. We're doing this all, um, all academic year long. So I hope you will continue to think about this concept and find ways in which to engage in these conversations and continue to support and enjoy the works of our research centers who are really spearheading this work for us. Today's moderator of our panel is Dr. Ann Brodsky. She is professor of psychology who has been studying risk, resilience, and the role of community in promoting and thwarting um, success for the past 30 years. Her most recent work is in the development of the trans-conceptual model of resilience and empowerment, which enables theoretical and practice exploration of the similarities and differences between resilience and empowering goals and the process by which people shift between the two. Dr. Brodsky is also the chair of our psychology department here and really looking forward to how she navigates this um, complex term for us today. So Dr. Brodsky. Dr. Brodsky. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our panelists. Um, and, and thanks for joining us. And, and now that everyone has problematized uh, something that I've found both fascinating and problematic for 30 years, um, you know, it's, it's time for snacks. But first, we are going to have some answers from our, our panelists who um, are, are here to join us and talk about this um, concept, which I, I, I think there's promise in this concept as well. So I hope we'll talk about um, highs and lows of it. Um, so let me start by introducing them. Um, Dr. Earl Brooks at the far end is an assistant professor of English and his research interests include music, African-American rhetorical traditions and composition. He has a forthcoming book entitled Resonance of Resistance, which explores the rhetoric of black music through the work of um, Scott Joplin, Duke Ellington, John Coltrane, Mary Lou Williams and, and Mahalia Jackson. So thanks for being with us. Um, Dominique Nell, um, to his left, is a photographer, activist, and farmer chef who's focused on healing communities through various mediums. He's the founder of City Weeds, a trauma-informed food business that strives to eliminate food deserts and improve health, wellness, and independence of Baltimore City residents through growing and selling of microgreens and uh, cold-pressed juices. Um, Dominic's vision for City Weeds is to feed and heal the community by growing food on vacant lots. Yes. Thanks and welcome. Thank you. 
Uh, to his left is uh, Letha Devane, whose wonderful works are, are here behind us. She's an accomplished multimedia artist who explores diverse political, social identities, and cultural interpretations. Her work's been in numerous solo and group exhibits throughout the U.S. and the United Arab Emirates, and is in the collection of the Baltimore Museum of Art. She's born in Baltimore, uh, received her BFA from Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA, our neighbors up the road, um, and an MFA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and her solo exhibition here is on from September 22nd through December 17th. So hope you'll check it out after our discussion, and another time as well, you'll have time to come back. Um, and last but not least, Dr. Mas Ma Marcella Mellinger is an associate professor in the School of Social Work. She teaches policy courses as well as an intimate violence, uh, partner violence elective. Uh, her research interests include advocacy, intimate partner violence, and social work education. So thank you all for being here. Um, we're starting with a really simple question. It, you know, it, it just sort of scratches the surface. So I'm, I'm interested in what everyone's definition of resilience is. Um, if, you, if you have one, uh, uh, your working definition or your uh, momentary definition. Do you want to go for it? <laughs> <laughs> Start it, Betty. All right. Um, so I think of two phrases um, in relation to resilience. The first one is, uh, a Mary Baraka's term, the changing same, which um, he coined in 1966, I believe, to describe the relationship between black music production and racist oppression, right? And that as that oppression evolved and changed, so did the evolution of the styles, right? And I like that term because it, it points our attention towards Oppression is something that is nimble, that's not static, that can respond to strategy. Um, and I think about that in relation to, you know, even our recent current events, like um, uh, the comments Justice Roberts made about the Voting Rights Act, right, where, you know, he kind of said, well, we're beyond that <laughs> now, right? Um, I think he had a very static perception of what racial oppression was. He didn't see it as something that can be fluid and, and mm -hmm. evolve and change and switch tactics and style shift, you know. Uh, the other uh, phrase I think about most in relation to resilience is counter narrative, which I think is a good way to think about the vast storehouse of language and stories within African American rhetorical traditions, right? So that's things like folklore, like, um, John Henry and his hammer, mm -hmm. you know, the trickster rabbit. Um, uh, uh, what's another one? Shine and the Titanic. Uh, all of those are stories of survival and resilience, right, that are, that are proverbs and are passed down through generations. And then there's also things at the level of um, the sentence, at the sentence level in terms of African-American vernacular, where we have tropes of resilience literally in the language itself, mm -hmm. like, making a dollar out of 15 cents, mm -hmm. or making a way out of no way, or never let them catch you slipping, or you know, I could go <laughs> on and on. Uh, yeah, you know. So it gets in indexed um, at the side of, of language and, and cultural production. And I'll pass the rock to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, I was still processing a lot of what he was saying. Um, mine isn't as eloquent, however, um, a couple of things when I think of, when I think of resilient that we all can re relate to is that fly that you can't get rid of, <laughs> that fly is resilient <laughs> at the picnic table, at the dinner table, um, mosquitoes are resilient, um, <laughs> when I think in terms of myself, um, initially, I, I there's, um, a level of insanity um, because there's a there's a, a embedded assumption that doing the same thing will actually get a different result like who you got to be kind of insane um, by the definition of insanity is doing the same thing expecting a different result 
Um, I think resiliency is can be defined the same way, only that it's, you know, there's the faith that we're, we're looking for a different result. And um, he's given beautiful context, so I don't think that I need to backtrack what I'm referring to. Um, however, for the sake of students having something to take away other than my freestyle thoughts, um, something like the kind of unnoticed excellence that, that comes around every day unremarkably. The hidden talents of friends and coworkers. The, <clears throat> a lot of this is touching. Um, the fleeting souls of subway, solos of subway cheers, buskers, applause. Um, you know, when you, mm -hmm. if you've been to New York, you know, that's kind of like resiliency, you know what I mean? And, and so all, and from cultures that I can relate to, it's that grandma, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It might in fact be grand, granddad, but it's definitely grandma and great grandma, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, 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 that de and so the definition of it, it gets told through the calluses of the, of, of the thumbs and the hands of the, of the people that I touch. And so my hands can still be soft at 46 hmm. and still doing hard work. It's still there. Um, waking up each day um, with, a blind, with blind faith, I would say, is an ingredient for what I translate as resilience in retrospect to the work that I do in community that reflects the work that of the on the panel. Um, so we're just talking about one word. I'll, I'll, I'll about to go down a rabbit hole. I'll pass it by. <laughs> I guess I'll use this mic. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for listening. Um, it's it's very difficult because I've thought about this word ever since uh, Anne brought it up that we had to talk about resilience and. It really is something that, as was said, very much a part of really the African American community. I have to say that. I'm sure it's part of everybody's community, but, but specifically in the context of how uh, we process our lives and how we are to pick ourselves up and move forward. Those were things that I remember my father always talking about, uh, is that you don't stop. And whatever the goal is, if you want to reach a goal, you have to go after it. And if you fall down, you pick yourself up, look at that goal, and change your perspective on it. Um, I think that in raising children, I think that's the most difficult thing that we could ever do. Because we're supposed to give them that ability to walk through this world, to be spirited beings walking through this world. And I can say that I thought I did that. And in other cases, I look at my two people in my life. And as they get older, I know that part of me has to back off from who they are because they're going to be who they're going to be. Um, the thing that really is important to me is how do we feed our spirits? How do we feed our lives in the sense that um, we are allowed to, to take those steps, to give those steps? Because the most important thing that's happening in our world at this moment and I'm 70 years old, and I look around, and I think we have failed in many, many ways. In various communities, we fail tremendously. And the fact that we have the, the amount of wealth that we have in a community, and we still have people who are not educated, people who are not in a position to understand that their inner self is the most important thing 
to develop, for them to be able to survive. And we can't give up on them. We can't give up on them because they did something wrong that we didn't like, or there's somebody different that we don't like. I have tried to, in my own life, follow some path of where I believe one should go, and I've tried to help my children see that too, and they don't always see the same thing, and that's, that's it. That's the way it is. But I think the basic tools that we give them in order for them to survive this world is a sense of their sense of self, their ability to talk back if they have to, their ability to say, I am who I am. I have no shame about being who I am. And all those things to me are some of the, the core elements of what we give to children. I don't care if they're our own or other people's. And I loved what was said, grandmothers, absolutely. <laughs> My grandmother, she would pull a switch off the tree. And if you did something wrong, your ass would be <laughs> totally, not whipped, but you know, you get that stick. And it wasn't vicious, it was to say, you need to pay attention. Pay attention to what you're doing. Pay attention to who you're speaking to. Respect me. Those are things that she taught me. And I think those are things that we have in our society have lost. I, I go that route, I feel like we've lost a lot. So that's all I wanted to say. Okay. So when I think about resilience, uh, Typically, when I used to think about, when I was learning about the concept, I would think about you know, adapting to difficult situations and then people bouncing back. And um, as I got into the field of social work and learned about people's lives and, and was able to step back and look at my own life and the lives of my family, my friends, the question that comes up is bouncing back to what? <laughs> What does bouncing back mean? And I think that part of my definition and the way it has evolved is this idea that resilience is gonna look different for every single person. What is resilient for, for me is not going to be resilient for the next person, even if our experience, even, even in my own family, even if it's my sister who you know, grew up in the same home and had similar experiences. So that's one of the things that I think about. The, the other thing I think about is when I used to think of resilience, I thought of the, the future. You know, it's, it's adapting to something and coming up with something different and being able to survive and being able to adapt. And the more I think about it, the more it has become more of a, the here and now. It's today. It's what do I have to do today? What do the people that, that, that my students are working with out in the field? Um, are helping people do so that they can get through that one day. And I think often in our society, we expect certain outcomes of people and we think if, if your life doesn't look this way, then you must not be resilient. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to my students, I often say, don't ask people, how are you today? Ask people, what, how did you get here? Tell me about your life and even today, what did you have to do today to figure out how to get on a bus and get to your appointment? Because even being able to do that is part of us being resilient. So those are the two things for me. One is it's, it's not just this long term, this is what I was eventually able to do, it's more about today and what can I do day to day so that I can get up tomorrow and do what I need to do mm -hmm. in order to be able to move forward. The other piece of resilience is this concept of adaptability. And yes, we live in an environment in which we need to adapt and we need to think about how we 
function in an, our environment. But I like to think about it the other way around and more about what do I, how do I shape my own environment so that I can do what I need to do in order to move forward and in order to be able to get up tomorrow and come back and do it again. Uh, and often just that short term today in the now is what gets us to eventually those of people that look at resilience as a future thing uh, we need to look at each one of those days that happen and what was it I, I've worked with uh, trauma victims who think well I'm not getting better or I'm not thinking about what I need to be thinking about but you're here you're here today and you're sharing your, your story you're here today and you're thinking about what do you need to do because you have children because mm -hmm. you have a job because you have whatever is in your life today in order for you to be able to get up tomorrow and do it again. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Wow, what a powerful way to, to start a conversation. Um, and we did, we did not plan this. We did not um, interact at all. But you know what I heard was a lot of the concepts that come out of the literature that I spend a lot of time with and the, the ways that my work has explored resilience. So you were talking about this process of resilience. It's not a final outcome. Um, we don't just get there and we're done. Um, and it's not, it, it's very context specific, right? You can be very resilient at work and just be falling apart at home or you can be resilient in your community and, and a mess somewhere else. Um, and the, the process has these steps in it that, that all of you talked about. So there's this awareness, this awareness that something isn't going right and that I deserve better. I want to feel better. I want something to change. There's this goal setting and these intentions of, of what do I want to do? What do I need to do next? Um, there's an action that's taken that is something that moves us towards adaptation or towards at least just withstanding for now or towards resisting what it is, changing, changing the environment rather than adapting to it in some ways. And then there's this reflection, like how did it go? Is this working for me? Do I feel any better? Am I getting to the tomorrow I want to get to? Or do I need to regroup and reflect and change the way I think about it, et cetera. Um, and uh, Marcella started to talk about like how did you get here? And so that's kind of my next question for you all is, is how did you get to this point of, of this sort of way of thinking about resilience? And, and how, how have you seen it reflected in the work that you do in the communities you work with in the, in the, um, the um, ideas that you study and, and commit your lives to? Um, it took a lot of love and care, uh, I say, to get me here. Um, pertaining to the subject matter, I would say that it's a, um, it's a part of the journey, but more importantly, a lot of the words that you just mentioned begin, start with the letters R, E. So, um, the initial um, definition when I referred to it in my phone was actually a definition referring to the word silience. And so resilience is actually redoing the unremarkable things each and every day. Mm -hmm. um, if we wanna do it in, from a basic one plus one, how does this word become this thing? That we create an, a greater umbrella meaning around it, I would say. Um, words, that's why I said ingredients, um, because it takes a level of consistency. And as I said, by def uh, insanity, by definition, because you're hammering at the nail <laughs> that's already in the wood, hoping that the wood will turn into steel. And so knowing, knowing that it may not, but this, this action, is, there's, there's psychology in that, because there's an action step that sometimes something that's invisible, like faith, you don't see it. So you have to apply an insane action step to it to kind of keep uh, the physics going, you know, of it. For me, it, it's almost the routine of it, or I use words like redundancy, and there's that RE again. <laughs> and then, and then but, but people see consistency. So I, 
I have to acknowledge that. So there's a certain, so redundancy, consistency, all of these are ingredients of what we would say this word <coughs> silience is to do that over again for it to be resilience, for it to be then resilient, um, I would say. Um, and for me, it's like salmon. Um, I've been swimming upstream and notably. And so for that, I, I have to have a set resilience in that I know that I'm not gonna get the calculatable results can go in the other direction, which I'm very well versed in. It's the fact that the unknown, I'm algebraically thinking, I need to find out what X is or what Y is, what, the, what the, those variables are. And so I apply that specifically those equations to the neighborhood by taking what was given before me, uh, a drug economy. So I've seen products being distributed at a high rate and I've seen them what they equal. So my, my formula is the exact same formula, only my variables are not vehicles of death and despair, they're um, platforms for health and wellness. And so that's why I'm having a plant-based corner store that gives away free vegetables on North Avenue. For one, North Avenue does not have any grocery store from Hilton to Milton, which mm -hmm. is from east to west. Mm -hmm. And so intentionally being black owned by a black man that is to go against all the grains of these, of these uh, percentages. All right, the predominant black owned businesses in Baltimore are 70% women owned. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm going against the grain of that. There's no grocery store on North Avenue. Okay, I'm going against the grain on that, swimming upstream on that. People need health and wellness. They got now and latest Coke, Pepsi, all different forms of, of unhealthy things of, at a high rate of availability, liquor stores. So okay, be more green, you know what I mean? On the corner of North and Pulaski, you know what I mean? And it's not hope because hope to me is standing in the same spot waiting for something to change. And it's very hollow to me, it's an empty cup. We can debate on that. Faith is the action step that I don't know which direction west is. However, I need to walk in, I might have to walk south and hit a, scrape my foot on a rock to look up and see the North Star <laughs> to realize I'm not going. But that came, that action step came through faith. So that I know there's a lot of mistakes I'm gonna make because I'm, I don't know what X is. And when I find out what, what X is, I don't know what Y is. Or why these things occurred because History can tell you the facts and the data and the, and the information, the percentages to give me a platform to swim upstream. Um, so resilience has to be a part of that equation. So when, you, when I was asked to unpack something that is packed into lunch every day, um, as, a, as basically tattooed to the, to the soul at that point, it, it, was, it was refreshing because it's something that we, we grab, we, it comes with the, the territory. It comes with, um, for me, the Native American struggle that we don't speak of. You know what I'm saying? The people that were pounced upon in order for these platforms and institutions to be built, the lies that were put in place to where some of us think that we're African Americans and we might actually be Native Americans because the greatest trick the devil actually pulled was convincing that the world that he did not exist. So we have a lot of confusion ab about indigenous and all of these things. And because I've been gifted to have a fraction of the knowledge of who I am from myself to my ancestors, from myself in the place of, of the human of the human race, um, the human word, like human, like colored man is what, the, what human means. You know what I'm saying? So when you're looking at the resilience of the human being, being is an action step. So colored man action is what human being stands for. And so how do you actually identify that when, you're actually, when you actually know that? Outside of the color codes and the systematic structural systems that helps us build this ingredient that we call resilience, um, as we unpack these things, we get to rebuild the structure of society um, from our own ideals that we're able to see. Based off of previous experiences, of course, but looking to not 
to make sure like, okay, now we have a television, a telephone, a radio, a camera. Those are all four and five different things that I can remember when I had those four and five different devices. And now they've magically <laughs> morphed into a thing. So we have the tech, we have the technology and the know-how and, and, and the ability and the money and the resources to create things that are functional for society, almost to a detriment. Um, so I'll stop there. I, I think that's an interesting, very interesting point. I, I have often said um, to my students and to my kids that, that the African presence and the African American presence is definitely inter intertwined in, in so many ways. And as I traveled, uh, what I began to notice was how how societies themselves obviously are structured. Um, the thing that, that really would catch me was how people worshiped. What were, the, what were the methods in which they approached the divine, so to speak? And we all have this notion of what that might be, and if, of course nobody knows what it is. Um, and so for me, it has, it has always been the search for that, that core of that person or that human being. But in terms of the African who landed on the shore of the various continents, we all know this, because you guys are all educators. I'm not telling you anything new. Um, when the Africans landed on these shores, they came with their spirits intact in a way that could not be taken away from them. So if you think about if you think about the various ways the culture uh, 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 moved through South America, through Cuba, through the Americas, through North America, people carried that part of themselves with them, whether it was through voodoo, whether it was through Christianity, whether it was through the practices that they had, they transformed those practices to become their own. And I think when I, if you ask me about how I came to where I am, it's looking at the incredible um, strength that people came with and tried to connect to each other, even though their languages were different. I don't think that there's a real understanding sometimes of that connectedness, and then that connectedness, of course, translates to a larger world, and of course, the culture that we created as Africans and African Americans, I have to say this, it is embedded in the American culture so deep that white people don't have a culture, that's why they glopped on to African American culture. I just have to say it, because it's so, um, this notion of how is it that we've gotten to where we are uh, and how is it that we continue to uh, deal within a system of racism, it's just, it's just phenomenal, it's too crazy. And it should not exist, and we all know this. And this is the kind of thing that I think when I go through looking at Thomas More, who is basically a monk, I'm curious how he got to where he got to. All right, why is it that he is the person that he is? And the struggles that we all go through and the traumas that we all go through are incredibly, uh, the incredible lessons, as they say. They're the lessons. Now how we come back from those traumas is our resilience. You use the word strength, and I think for me, when I think about how did I get to where I am today and thinking about resilience from this perspective is the, the concept that we teach our students in social work from the time they take their first course, which is the strength perspective. It's looking at people, their actions, their beliefs, their thoughts, um, their attitudes, their personalities as strengths and instead of deficits. And so how do we then use those strengths 
to help, or how do they use their strength, not us, how do they use their strength to help them do and reach the goals that they have for their own lives. And sometimes our, our job is just simply helping people see what that new door or that new way or that new path is and being able to see that path through and instead of looking at things as deficits and just needs, you're coming to me because you just have this need. You don't have food, you don't have housing, you don't have transportation. And yet, again, back to my previous comment, here you are today and you got here somehow. So how can we look at those actions and those behaviors as a strength and then help people see that they're strengths and continue to use them as strengths and instead of simply seeing them as needs that need to be met. Mm -hmm. um, I was at a field visit today for those of you that are not as familiar with social work. Our students do an internship and as they are out in the community, we are part of our jobs is we go out and we check in, we check in with their supervisors, make sure that they're doing what they need to do. And I was talk as I was talking to the student and, and the social worker, she was giving him an example of the differences between her, and he's at a hospital, working at a hospital, how the medical field uh, looks at a patient versus how she as a social worker looks at a patient. And she was saying to the student, if you look at my assessment and you look at somebody from the medical field's assessment, you're going to see a huge difference. Mine, she said, is going to be much longer. <laughs> uh, and, and I said, yeah, it is going to be much longer because, uh, and I said to the student, if you remember back to our classes, we, we have these conversations around a strength-based perspective versus a, a deficit perspective or a problem-solving perspective. And so you have two professionals that are trying to get to the same goal, but looking at the issue from a very different perspective. And I think that that perspective of strength and looking at people's strengths and not simply as problems that I have to solve is one of the ways in which I, I've gotten to where I am today. Um. I guess the way that I would answer that question, all of your answers are so beautiful, thank you. Um, um, I would say moments of political consciousness over time. And so one of the earliest memories that I would say would be a moment of political consciousness for me would be, um, I was very, very fortunate to be able to spend some time with my great grandmother before mm -hmm. she passed. And I remember one day I was over her house, and um, you know she was from the generation that they just listened to radio, mm -hmm. right? They didn't even really watch TV. Like the radio was the thing, and so she would listen to her radio, and I would just kind of you know, you know, do some random stuff around the house to keep myself entertained. And so I remember one day I finally decided I was going to go. She had this this bookshelf in her house full of books. And I decided I was going to pull one of those books and, and see what was inside. And I opened it up, and on the inside of the jacket, she had stamped from the library of Edna Brown. Mm -hmm. right? And she had that stamped in all the books mm -hmm. in, her, in her bookcase. And that was a really, um, I think, radicalizing moment for me, now that I think back, you know, because it was um, her, her even though she didn't tell, she didn't teach me to this explicitly, but what it, it, what it communicated to me was this ownership of knowledge mm -hmm. seeking, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how that was a vital uh, value to her life experiences. And so as I, you know, went into, you know, elementary school and, and progressed to school, I always had that memory of seeing knowledge as not just something out there, but something that could be sought after and possessed in a very personal, intimate way, right? So I, I, I think of your question as, you know, mo as those kinds of moments of political consciousness raising. And then I also really like this term. Uh, it's a term from Michel Foucault, epistemic break, right? Which is um, the process of breaking out of uh, discourses that govern or justify the status quo, right? And so 
for me as, as someone that really loves music and, and art, I, I see music and art as really, really crucial vehicles for breaking out of discourses, right? Even if it's at the level of the affect or states of mind, right? Even if you don't have it, you know, in a, a set of explicit lyrics, right? It's, you know, vehicles that can move people, right, to, to certain spaces that allow them to question the world around them in a, in a productive way, right? And, s and looking at that as a means of survival. Right? So that's kind of what I think about. Thank you all again. Um, so, um, you know, you've, you've touched on these really core elements, right? Uh, and core positive elements of, of existence, of life, of, of um, language, spirit, strength, consciousness, knowledge. Um, and in the best of terms, you know, that's what resilience gets us towards. But as Kimberly started us off, <laughs> there's also can be a flip side to it. And so I wonder about your thoughts about the ways in which um, resilience doesn't help us in, 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 in helping communities and individuals um, obtain these really important core elements of self. Sure, I can start with that. I think one of the, the concerns that I have is that when we use the term, we assume that there is one way to be resilient and that it needs to look a certain way, that there is an outcome that we are expecting. And that tends to put people in boxes and it can be counterproductive because if my experience doesn't look like your experience, then maybe I'm not as resilient as you are. And, and not that we do this consciously. I don't know that any of us are going around thinking, oh, I'm not as resilient as the next person over. But we, we do think about the fact that what, what, does, what does my life need to look like? How, what is the ultimate outcome that I that society is expecting of me in order to to be seen, to be heard, to be counted as part of society? And I think that when when we make that assumption that there is just one way in which res resilience looks like, then we tend to dismiss those. So if if a child if, if a trauma victim. Um, doesn't graduate from high school and doesn't go to college, does that mean that they were not resilient? Uh, if, if someone who it was in an intimate partner violence uh, relationship uh, chooses to stay in the relationship because those are the only options that they have and the rest of the world says, well, they must not be that resilient because um, why didn't you just pick up and go? Well, maybe that was the only way that they had to survive because they knew that if they left, uh, their life would be literally over. And so I think that how we view the, the result or the end product of what resilience should be, I think that that's a way in which it can potentially be detrimental because it's not going to look the same for everyone. It, it's interesting that you mentioned that because the two examples, <coughs> excuse me, the two examples that you mentioned from my spectrum, equal resilience. Yeah. Um, when I see an unsheltered person that is is um, is there the week, weeks, months, years later, that's resilience. Yeah. Um, so I, I I agree that there's a humongous amount of um, interpretations of the ingredients that it takes for that word to manifest in in the self. But there are there are undeniable examples of it all around us, and I think that the language that you just used is really um, detrimental and, and and helpful for the greater populace that doesn't see the resilience in that, right. be, because then they they've been misinformed in 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 a, in a way in a so to speak. I mean, because resilience is an immigrant coming here from, from Ireland and so-called pulling themselves up by their brute straps. Resilience is also that um, son of a slave that didn't have boots. So is one greater than the other? No, because both of, like, 
there was more challenges, I would say, for some than others. Like, we can agree for that, but I'm not going to take away the, the resilience of a man or, or, or a family that pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. However, again, the ones that didn't have boots, were they not resilient? Mm -hmm. So if they, if they have descendants, is that not resiliency? You know what I mean? The resilience that it takes a mother to see her children being taken away from her and she doesn't kill herself? Is that not resilience? Because some of us are the products of that. A lot of us are the products of that because mm -hmm. if we're speaking of America, right. you were breastfed by these women. It doesn't matter what complexion you are because your ancestors had it set up that way. Now, if you're coming in post that experience as an immigrant or someone coming from another country after that, please understand that the, that there's my ancestors are dead in the soil from the Native American massacres that occurred, and then when they brought Africans over to cultivate the land, those are the backs and shoulders of the people that you all get to pull bootstraps up off off of. We're the soil and the dirt of that. So is anyone is anything more resilient than the other one? Is the earth not resilient that can't speak to us other than lightning and thunder and, and water, you know? And, and so that's resilient, that tide that we look at, that um, I just came back from doing some food justice missions in Utah this past, um, these past few days, and I was in the mountains. And you wanna talk about resilience? A mountain. You know, as I'm going up there, there's a song that says, Be a Mountain, and then um, the author is, I can't think of the name, but saying that being in the mountains, you will find out that nothing is rational. <laughs> like, if you just look at a mountain and see how a tree is growing and there's a rock, and, it, and you just look at it, and it's greater than anything that you could possibly think of, and it's around there sitting quietly looking at you while you think, while, while we think we're resilient. Resilience is all around us, you understand what I'm saying? The deer that still pop up that haven't been diminished. Those endangered species that are still not dead, like extinct yet, that's what, that's what we need to draw resilience from. Those COVID. Those COVID. <laughs> um, so I guess that was my time. So. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, and I don't know if that was even, like it was kind of attaching to what you were saying, because I hear resilience, and I, these are stories of resilience that, that the thing that's unseen and unremarkable the, it is that unremarkably. So there's no remarks made about this. This is a silence. There's almost like re-silence, even though there's a silliness in it. I, I used to look at it as like silence. There was a silence in resilience. Like you're not gonna hear it, there's not, you're not even gonna see it. It's a person develops a callus, and then and we know. Or you see that stamp in that in, on them books, and that don't. I mean, that almost brought tears to me because I, I, mm -hmm. I felt I felt that that that, and for a black woman during the time that she came in, how valuable education was, how valuable learning the languages of the oppressor was was detrimental to our survival. Yes. Want to talk about resilience? You know what I'm saying? So you all ha we all have um, examples to pull from if our own backyard seems to be mundane or you know lackluster it's not it's not giving us that feel that vibe we need to 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 be motivated for it we don't have to look far to find it is what i'm saying we can look to nature and, and me as a farmer i have to plug that the, the resilience in me looking at a, growing stuff because you have to know everything and then you have to know that you know nothing that's absolutely yeah. right yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really appreciate your examples because that's exactly what, again, typically as a society, those are the things that we don't see. Mm -hmm. um, I, I keep going back to, to my field visits, but I was at, a, at an, an agency on Tuesday. Of course, I had this in the back of my mind, and I was visiting a student that's working with people who are unhoused. Mm -hmm. And as I was walking into the agency, and there are people on the outside, people in the inside, all I could think of was wow, they are resilient, much more resilient than I am that you know, gets in my car and goes back to work and then goes back to my house. Here they are uh, living every day. And so those are the examples that we typically don't see when we think of the word resilient. And yet, 
they are the ones that are resilient. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I did the, the, the uh, collaborative project with my friend Tadia Rice, and I call her my sister. She's pretty intense, <laughs> um, but I love her to death. She's somebody who does what she says she's going to do, without question. And she's from a Turkish background, so she's got all that going, you know, a little bit of anger, a little bit of, you know, uh, her involvement with uh, social issues. But the thing about that project, for me, we had been, you know, I had been in uh, uh, prison projects, you know, from the time I was like maybe 15 years old. I would go with someone, you know, who was teaching poetry or reading from, you know, various writings and stuff. And it always intrigued me how people survived in those situations because um, this project with Beyond Bars was one that that taught me so much about myself, you know, about, uh, about the whole issue around judgment, how we go about judging others. And a number of these women have, have obviously children or have been in situations where they've made mistakes, where they've, you know, they, they fought to um, survive, you know, within the years that they've been given. Some people be give, have been given life sentences uh, for crimes, and so they, they're they not innocent per se, um, but they are in the process of looking at their lives. And when I, when I raise the concept of trauma, how do we, how do we all obviously deal with that? Where's that? Where's that core in ourselves that allows us to move forward? They're stuck in a situation where they literally have to, to meditate on what they've done, you know, over those years. And in that process of meditating, they come to a point where the realization is that I'm a human being. You know, I am somebody who made a mistake. I am somebody who uh, is, deserves at least the respect of my humanness. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, we all know, again, how this prison system has been working for the last 100 years and who gets incarcerated. And most of these women who are Hawaiian uh, or African American, they're the largest population within those prison systems still. So I always really wonder, you know, when do we get to that point in, in that kind of activism, in that kind of uh, understanding that those people who come out of prison may live next door to us. We don't know. And we don't know our neighbors sometimes. And all I can say is that I had no idea how incredible my neighbors were until my husband died. Now, that said to me that I had not reached out to them either, right? And the trauma of all of that to me is something that we have to begin to process and think about what it means to be resilient in those situations, whether it's in prison, whether it's coming out of prison, whether it means getting to know your neighbor, whether we like them or not, you know? I mean, because they're people I thought, they're damn, uh, what do you call them, um, uh, magas. I don't want to know them. <laughs> and all I can say is that they end up being the people who help me. So there's a whole issue around trying to figure out in our, life, in our lives, um, what does it mean to, to develop a way of working with or, or respecting or even dealing with those people who we assume are lesser than? Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. It was for me, not necessarily for you, but for me. <laughs> oh, um, that's beautiful. Uh, I so um, I had a, a professor uh, he's retired now Bernard Bell um, and he would always say the goal of a scholar is you, you know historicize contextualize problematize right? <laughs> and so thinking about you know problematize, problematizing resiliency um, of course there's the the issue of the way that discourses of resiliency can place undue emphasis on the 
individuals to deal with structural problems, right? And, and, and you know, we, we met, had, you know, talked about that. Um, but the other thing that I'm thinking about that's a little bit more n new, at least in, in our current public discourse, is folks who co-opt narratives of resiliency mm. uh, to justify their behaviors, actions, financial or political gains. Mm. And when we apply scrutiny to those narratives, we find that they're either greatly exaggerated or fictitious, right? And that distorts the public sphere in, in, real, in two ways, right? Because first, it masquerades um, privilege and just turns of good fortune mm -hmm. as matters of personal strength and brilliance, mm -hmm. right? And the other way that it distorts is that it, it makes a mockery of, of the lived, experience of, of lived experiences of people who really have overcome a lot of obstacles, mm -hmm. right? So it, then it, it further entrenches an unfair playing field mm -hmm. in, in many ways. So I've been thinking a lot about, I guess you could say, um, the dark side, I don't know if I'm getting too Star Wars or anything, but <laughs> like the dark side of resiliency discourse, too. So, um, yeah. Any examples? I, huh? Example. I mean, examples? I, I don't want to name names, though. But, uh, <laughs> so, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I don't want to. Would you, did you have something? No, to say? no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll hold that. Oh, okay. <laughs> hold that I'll, 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 I'll I, I would just say it's, it's, in, it's really in vogue for people of great wealth to weigh in on important matters facing our democracy and in yes. our society yeah. with, and then stake their ethos for those arguments based on narratives of their resilience, mm -hmm. right? But when, when we look into those stories, we find out that that's not always accurate, right? So um, they then, you know, apply those rubrics, right, to groups of people in unfair ways, right? So I, I think about you know how that happens a lot. And yes, um, and that so to me it's still it's a spectrum. It's a it's a spectrum. It's a fulcrum. It's a pendulum of which is all resilience. So um, it's like energy. Energy has currents, frequencies, and different versions of it because there's a certain level of resilience that has been put in place. There's hard work of doing the same thing over to make sure they get the same result each and every time. Um, we're talking about the systematic, supremic structures. And so it gives me back to, to policy wherein when we're speaking in terms of humans, how it was written into policy that certain people were only three-fifths of a human. Mm. So I think that in the, the greater discussion of us getting an understanding of how we, how we got here, it's also understanding that we have, because we're operating in this constitutional structure, that we also have the power to change the policies. So like, not just sitting around in, in colleges talking about it, but actually like putting the vote to it, having it in the curriculum of the students mm -hmm. and in action-based work, like where we're going down to Annapolis and we're making this happen because um, I got legislation passed. Um, it was a toy gun raid that we did in the city that kind of sparked my healthy corner store mission, mm -hmm. which didn't work uh, in the full effectiveness the corner store aspect of it, so then I had to go and get my own corner store. But as far as <laughs> policy being passed for replicas guns now being a fine, I didn't think that was good enough. But my elders had to let me know that from eight months of social media and actual going out to canvassing areas and corner stores and connecting with the right people, I got a policy, something passed into policy. I didn't think, oh, fine, that's not doing anything. I, I wanted more. I, you know, I'm rage against the machine. The system is broken. It doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. I had to be balanced down by my elder saying, hey, bro, you realize that there's been many protests and many 
rages against the machine that no policies were passed. He said, you eight months of what was subsidized diligence compared to my ancestors um, got policy passed. I know. Yeah. So with those that, that small thing, I had to then, so I was spitting in the face of my ancestors by like, oh, that's nothing. You know what I mean? Like I almost kind of, like it felt like a, a, a failure. Like I, I didn't do anything. Fine, that's anything. That's not going to stop. You know, that's how I felt. But also seeing that a bro anything that is broken can be fixed. You know what I'm saying? Or we get we confuse things. So the dark side of, of resilience also looks like me standing in the field operating in integrity and knowing that I know better and I'm not doing better. <laughs> so not so so now I'm having a tug of war between integrity and intelligence. I'm an intelligent being. However, I had to subsidize and shelf some of that to for, for the sake of the good work. That's resilience, possibly. You know what I'm saying? So in that, now I had to step out of that because I got there was a certain pride in I'm doing the work. And not, oh, not that you're not doing the work. There was just a pride in me doing the work that I overlooked how intelligent I was. Okay, to, reparations doesn't look like a, a, the stork dropping the check in the field while I'm, while I'm cleaning up. <laughs> it, it doesn't look like that, but I, it was some resiliently, the insanity got to me where it's like, oh, doing the same thing, it's, it's gonna happen. Then I had to be smart, like, okay, what's the risk versus the rate of return, the ratios? I had to get the nerd in me and like, okay, you're not operating intelligently. And not to shelf my integrity, but to, I know better, so now I need to, to do better. And, and knowing better means I know I have friends, colleagues, those that know how to do the things more efficient and effective than I do, those that are doing the same things that I'm doing, so now let's overlap rather than be in competition. And then just outright learning the art of getting the money rather than complaining about why it wasn't coming from somewhere also, the damage assessment, in order, if we're going to talk about terms of reparations, once again, we, I, I'm, my dyslexia, I have to break it apart. So you're dealing with a genius dyslexic individual. Where, <laughs> so I have to learn left, that's ambidextrous. So I have, I, I'm seeing it left-handed, but I got to learn right-handed. So I know what I'm talking about, respectively, and, with, and, and modestly. So now when you when you put these things into an equation, go back to the algebraic thinking, you're taking what's given, you're seeing what your variables are, you're taking your strengths, it's strength-based. Yeah. Everybody's best interest, I mean, best effort shows up differently. I might be able to produce 10, you might be able to produce two. Your, your two is my, t like, that's our level. So, okay, let's give a goal of 15. Okay, between, we're gonna get 12 together by your ratios and my ratios, but can we get 15 today? So that means it requires more effort from me and you, and, and we have more um, production out of that. Whatever, whatever the case may be, that's, a, that's an equation for you know, functionality. Um, we teach in, in that it gets cultural competency which is something that we need to, because there's a lot of assumptions that the lies were true. And so people are coming in there with their chest out and hey, da 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 da, and I'm like, all right, did you, did you kind of, Google's around, you know, did you, did you, have you heard of that? You know what I'm saying? Um, so um, I, I lost the, the key, when I was saying there was a takeaway when, um, what is it? So, let your genius come through. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a, so when I looked at you, I said something related to, um, here's, there was like a takeaway I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And I got so excited in the passion <laughs> of it that it kind of got okay. shelved in It'll the process. So It'll I'll digress. You'll, you'll, you can come back. It'll come, come back, yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm going to give you a chance for it to come back because I, I just I love the interchange among you. And also, you should know that when I first like met everyone and said, OK, I was thinking we'd break it down like this, they were like, do we have to answer your questions? And some <laughs> of them you know, straight out said, you can ask me whatever you want, but I'm going to answer what I want. So I want to give them a chance oh, no. to say those things that they maybe haven't had a chance to fit in here by um, you know, answering questions. Um, so and, and then maybe it'll come back to Dominic too as we go along. Thank you. 
Was I the one that said I wouldn't No, I'm it. not naming any names. <laughs> Someone in the room, I think it was Kimberly, who said was she it, was, oh, was it, oh. Somebody, somebody. You know, all I had here was something that I thought was really interesting, and it came from Confucius. It, it says, our greatest glory is not in never falling, but rising every time we fall. And, you know, in terms of um, his, his life, um, he was someone who, I don't know, was really uh, rebelled against uh, in China, but his, his philosophy has become the basis of a lot of the, you know, uh, understanding of how, how we live our lives. But I also had all these books, my, my daughter would go crazy, because she organized all my books recently. <laughs> and she said, Mom, <clears throat> you have so many religious books here. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> do you read them all? I, I said, no, I don't read them all. But every now and then, I do pick up something because I always find myself, you know, in that, in that place where, if I'm doing the artwork or if I'm doing anything, I need to find a balance, a point of reference for myself. So what I did was I picked up Thomas More for you today, and it says. Spirit is the most creative, inspiring, and mean, meaning-giving element in all of life. Yet, it is also the most dangerous. When spirit visits us, it moves us toward action, commitment, ambition, goals, ideals, vision, and altruism. All of these feed the soul, but they also wound it. You have to think about that. All of these feed the soul, but they also wound it. Commitment, ambition, goals, ideals, vision, and altruism. To the soul, they, their opposites are equally important. Waiting, doubting, retreating, not going anywhere, not knowing, not seeing, and being absorbed in oneself. When the spirit is not grounded and checked by the soul, it quickly moves into literal forms, converting others and becoming blindly and callously ambitious. Its powerful force may turn without conscious to violence, its altruism blackened as intrusion into the freedoms of others. Its creativity becomes unbounded productivity, and its quest for ultimacy transforms into jealous possession of truth. Hmm. This is Thomas More, who became a monk. And I just picked it up because it just really made me think about, you know, how we, um, terms and how we define them. And there's always that opposite mm -hmm. to the terms. Mm -hmm. Always found it fascinating. <clears throat> That's why it's a spectrum of light and spirit. <laughs> <laughs> are, are we opening up for y'all asking us questions? <laughs> we, we can do that too. Right. Questions, comments for the, please. Yes. yes. Sometimes 
miracle, mm-hmm. but is resilience mm-hmm. adapting to the injustice? And obviously it's not. Um, but I think that that remains so powerful to tell, like that that political discourse um, in conversation with the spiritual discourse is really um, important. I wonder if any of you have any thoughts mm-hmm. on that, like what that, how do you, how do we navigate this? Go ahead. For <clears throat> for me to to give a, a fair playing field to an unfair um, scenario, resilience for me isn't something that it, it, it exists. It's like a spectrum of light and spirit. It's not it's not a thing that we can call positivity, positive or negative. It's in the hands of the individual, which and which then becomes the individual can be a group also. So then there's a certain pride that can be taken, like, okay, I come from tough stock, resilient people that that were able to survive. So I think that that's the word that we're not using in, in with resilience is survival. So when you're operating from resilience from a survival standpoint, there's an innate human connection, and maybe it's primal at that stake that we all can kind of, whether right, wrong, or indifferent, we're seeing that hey, what would I, what would, I would do the same thing if I was in that situation, mm-hmm. type of, type of, type of uh, energy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's at the survival level. When we're speaking of resilience at a civilized level with consciousness and now it can be used as a vehicle or a weapon or as a sticker or, or stamp, albeit validated, it's still now weaponized to a degree or it's used as a shield or it's used as a, um, a balancing act for a slippery, uneven economic slope that, you know what I'm saying? So, now when you're talking about those that have built wealth, albeit coming from resilient stock, then that resiliency with um, civilized conscious behavior, it's, that's when I feel as though that, that, that is at a detriment. And, and we're seeing that at multiple levels currently in the society. Some of these things have been going on for decades. Some of these other these things have been even going on for centuries just the same soup with less ingredients each time, like taking out the taste away from it. Um, so, so okay, we'll start there. So we, so now we can get agreements on both sides because we're not playing a tug of war. We're like letting the rope down. But it's more importantly, how do we take the resilience for the need to survive or for the need, um, a word that we're not using, justice? When we're talking about social justice, economic justice, environmental justice, yes. food justice, so on and so forth, all of these little line items and bullet points fall under like why a people or a person is in fact exuding this power of resiliency or this power to not to to continue to swim upstream, to continue to go against the grain, to continue to go rage against the machine, rock against bullets. You understand what I'm saying? Almost David versus Goliath. I think that we na- take the resiliency a, stre- a step further and how do, for one, David's band together to, to be the strongest Goliath, but more importantly, how does David and Goliath sit down and talk about it? And that might sound easier said than done, but planting more seeds of that, that my eyes may not see the fruit bearing from the tree of those seeds that's planted, but creating events like this, I mean, I got I to gotta shout out in the middle of this, um, of this discussion, Lee Boot. Like, he's the reason why I'm here and how I've been stitched into this. So, what was it, seven, five, seven? It's been a minute, it's like seven years ago. Seven years ago, I wasn't, I was beginning to be farmer now. 
but I wanted to be a public speaker. I even asked him to say, how is there any way I could teach? He said, you're smart, you know a lot of this. I said, I could teach history, I could teach math. I, and um, modestly, I, I, I teach plant science and botany at the College of Southern Maryland tomorrow. And so what I'm saying, that opportunity wouldn't have existed had you not um, cultivated my swimming upstream. Like, I mean, accept it because these are, these are the pieces of this. So me sitting here being able to talk a little bit more confident than seven years ago, um, it's, it's just another jot on the calendar. So, I'll, you know, I'll, there's a lot of growth since then for me in that. And what I'm saying is resiliency didn't change. Resiliency did transfer from a survival mind state because I'm in the middle of what I look, was looked like a war zone in Baltimore City. Still does. Still hasn't really changed in seven years. So I feel though, though I don't, I Farmer No isn't deserving to sit here because he still has more work to do. That's how I, I feel about it. Um, however, in being more civilized with my with my vehicle of of resilience, as if we may call it it's been able to be used as an empowerment tool. So we're looking at a, a tool, like a screwdriver is designed to screw screws, but you can also you do, can it. you can hammer with it, you can stab <laughs> something. There's multiple things, it could be weaponized, but it's a tool, you know what I'm saying? So I will look more at resiliency as the, as the innermost tool that we have in us, that gut feeling, it's gonna look and feel different for each of us, However, it's gonna have the same ingredients that, that we all kind of identify with. Um, and I know that that was an open, vague way. I don't have an answer for your question directly, so I'll be honest with that. I think that it's a, it's a evolving type of thing. I think that when another word we haven't mentioned is ego. I think when resilience and ego kind of go to, they don't go together. However, resilience is an ingredient in the human, and an ego is an ingredient in the human. So I think it's just a balance of the, of that, of those elements. I'm gonna take the lead from Dominic just very quickly. Um, I have to give a shout out to Lee Boot too. <laughs> 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 Sit down, Lee, because I think if it wasn't for Lee, first of all, I don't think I would have ever considered that piece in the museum ever to go in. And he came to my studio one year and he says, Aletha, I think that piece belongs in the museum. I said, hell no, it's never gonna get there. <laughs> but he also taught my son. And I can tell you that without his direction and his input into this boy's life, this young man he is now, that I don't think he would have ever felt as confident as he did about his work, the work that he does as an artist. So I shout out to you because I think it's very important to acknowledge those things. And you're my white brother, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I love that Al Alam asked those questions because it's a very, it is a difficult question, yeah. you know? And I think that uh, Dominic answered it quite well in that we've had, as human beings on this planet, what is it, 500,000 years maybe, mm -hmm. right? So to speak. And so if we're still in this phase of not only getting to know each other, but understanding each other in terms of the context of our societies and world, um, we have a lot of work to do with each other. And so I, I see the, the issues that are happening in Palestine and, and Israel because I have been to those places and I, love both peoples, right? But it has nothing to do with my love. It has more to do with how is it that we get to that stage where the politics of all of it, because we're, we're in a very, very frightful phase in our development as human beings because we're on the verge of either destroying the planet, right? Or destroying each other. And yet we don't have the wherewithal to, to kind of pull back and talk about this issue of, you know, how are we gonna treat each other? So I think the, the, the wars of, of, that are happening are ones that, and I think I said this to you before, and this is the most unfortunate way we get to know about each other. Mm -hmm. That's it. 
hopefully we'll get over that phase of our adolescence. Well, thank you all. You've, you've brought us back to sort of where we started, the changing same and uh, epistemic breaks and, and all of those things that are going on that mean that finding resilience in whatever way it means and in the most positive term of it and in a way that doesn't stop us or doesn't put us into one box but helps us to move forward as a people and move each other forward and support each other in that, in that mission um, as both individuals and as communities, um, I think as a, as a way of kicking off a discussion about resilience that will last the rest of the year, this has been a most excellent way to do so. And I hope you all join me in, in thanking our panelists for their contributions. <laughs>